We've seen what the archaeology has to tell us, and now it's time to put these developments into an evolutionary context. Appropriate, of course, to this double anniversary for Darwin and the publication of uh, the theory of, of evolution. I shall seek to show how the environment within which the evolution of Homo sapiens took place changed significantly at the time that we are considering, the end of the Pleistocene in geological terms and the very beginning of the Holocene. I shall argue that for us humans, the cultural environment has become what psychologists call the zone of proximal development, the primary arena within which selection operates on innovations and variations. First, I shall briefly refresh your memories of how symbolic culture became more elaborate and prominent alongside the formation and maintenance of large, permanently co-resident communities. And you will probably have recognized now that that phrase, large, permanent, co-resident communities, is a, a, a rather key uh, phrase in this series. The central task of this lecture is to explore what symbolic culture means and show how the ability to operate in terms of systems of symbolic representation can be fitted into the story of human cognitive and cultural evolution. And then the ob objective of the lecture is to reach the conclusion that a fully modern cognitive facility with symbolic culture emerged around 10,000 years ago, round figures, around 10,000 years ago, late Epipaleolithic, very beginning of the early Neolithic, and that is what made it possible and indeed desirable for people to live in large, permanently co-resident communities. First though, I, I want to pay homage to my old friend uh, Jacques Couvin, who died tragically at the end of 2001, just as the English language edition uh, of, his, uh, um, uh, of his extremely successful magnum opus in France was beginning to take off uh, in uh, Britain and uh, around the English-speaking uh, world. The very title of the book tells you what he wanted to convince us of, that the beginning of the Neolithic in Southwest Asia saw the emergence of icons of divinities, which he called a psychocultural revolution. It sounds better in French. Uh, or a revolution in symbols. <clears throat> and the title clearly places that revolution first and the emergence of farming uh, uh, um, second. Jacques' book has been very influential in the formation of my own ideas, even if, along with many other archaeologists, I find his arguments provocative but not necessarily convincing. What we've been looking at, I think, is the first major change in the way that humans lived since the genus Homo emerged. The evidence is that early Homo sapiens and all the earlier hominids and their Australopithecine predecessors all lived <coughs> by what is beginning to be called fission-fusion dynamics, <coughs> as do contemporary primates such as chimpanzees. According to this view of their social lives, a community would sometimes, perhaps rarely, come together, but would usually <coughs> consist of a number of small bands whose membership was flexible and not fixed. A recently published analysis of chimpanzee fission-fusion dynamics has shown that it's a very good adaptation for a sociable species, uh, balancing the need for biologically sustainable communities against the ecological imperative of living at low population densities in landscapes with thinly spread food resources. Though we've known that hunter-gatherer bands of 10 or 20 people are biologically and socially unsustainable, the basis of the TV program, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. <laughs> As archaeologists, we are condemned to seeing only the evidence for bands who might repeatedly use a particular cave entrance or rock shelter. What we never get to see are the occasions when those bands actually get together, come together, and the community for a while uh, uh, is face to face. That way of life, which early Homo sapiens shared with earlier species of the genus Homo and our close primate cousins, was transformed in the Epipaleolithic and early Neolithic periods when communities became, sorry, here it comes again, permanently co-resident. So instead of being a community which occasionally came together, it's a community which always lives together and it lives together in one place, long term and on a large scale. <coughs> 
as we saw, their communities became larger and those communities proceeded to bind themselves into wider and wider networks of symbolic exchange and shared ideas and cultural practices. It was a most demanding and challenging change. The new way of life required things like the building of trust in communities that lived together but were of such a size that any one person knew only a certain part of the whole social group. It involved the building of social capital, ideas of, like neighbourliness, the making and sustaining of social memory. It required indirect reciprocity and altruism and people needed to be able to detect, deter or punish freeloaders, free riders. All of these are things that we often take completely for granted in our lives but what they have in common is that they're all abstract constructs. The formation of large permanent, re permanently co-resident communities was dependent on such uh, uh, cultural constructs and the cognitive faculty of people to construct communities and sustain them by means of symbolic uh, representation. Permanent uh, um, settlements we've seen, and I'm just putting in uh, one or two slides just to uh, jog your, uh, your memory. This, uh, in the quiz at the end, you will all recognize is the second communal building at Jerf al in, uh, in in Syria. And this time there's also a view of the landscape in that part of the uh, Euphrates Valley in North uh, Syria as well. Uh, and uh, you have to remember that particular building, but uh, you didn't see this one. Oh, sorry, there's the, the two of the details from it. Uh, but here's another one just along the river, which is currently in the process of excavation by a Syrian uh, uh, prehistoric archaeologist. He's got about half of it, as you can see. It's going to be circular. It's going to be like the one uh, that we've just been looking at from uh, Jeff al Akma. And it's quite uh, intriguing because around the sides there are a series of uh, slabs and you can't see in this but if I bring one or two of the slabs forward you can see that these are uh, have got incised uh, elements on them some of them decorative chevrons so chevrons is a repeated theme uh, and uh, uh, other symbols or signs uh, which are um, quite uh, uh, distinctive and repeat on other sites We uh, were concerned uh, earlier on in the lecture series with the incorporation of burials. Here's another site which I haven't mentioned. This is a cross between Gobekli Tepe as a special site uh, and uh, the, all the other sites which have uh, incorporated burials because this is it's, a, it's on a hillside, a hilltop in uh, Galilee in Israel. It's being excavated by Nigel Goring Morris and it consists of what looks like architectural remains, walls and floors and being in the South Levant, they are uh, plaster lined, they're plaster floors, but the walls don't go up anywhere, they are just stumps. It's the making of floors beneath which there are burials, lots of burials, something like 70 burials in this particular area, this is all they've dug over the last few years, because it's so intensely complicated. <coughs> Elaborate um, uh, ceremonies accompanying burials, I don't want you to try and make sense of, of this series of diagrams. This is just the successive events in one pit, uh, which includes the remains of 11 um, wild bull <coughs> joints of meat, yeah? uh, bones from large uh, wild uh, bulls, and a human burial at the bottom. So a human burial and a series of feasting uh, events uh, following it, time after uh, time. Extremely complex uh, sequence of, of events, and we've also saw uh, uh, earlier on in the lecture series things like the recovery of skulls the modelling of uh, facial features on skulls and here's the strangest uh, one of all uh, from Fahoresh uh, where what looks at first sight like an animal skeleton outlined here in black, the bones are filled in in black on examination when the bones are lifted it turns out to be made of human bone so human bone from secondary burials recovered, disarticulated from burials from some time before being laid out in some deliberate pattern, again, in the uh, context of some kind of ceremony. So a ceremonial site which involved a great deal of activity with uh, human remains and feasting. Haven't shown you much of, in the way of small things, but they're there. We did see from Tel Abba that there are signs or, or designs carved onto stones. These are very small pieces of stone. They're no more than five centimetres, two inches uh, across. These ones come from Jerf al-Akmar. There's quite a number of stones like this which have got uh, patterns on them. 
But th when you start looking at these, it seems to me they're not really patterns. These are, I think, signs, yes? And I am tempted to even say, since these repeat at other sites now, again, the common phenomenon, once an archaeologist finds something and puts it in the, in the public domain, other people start popping up other ones. They say, oh, I've got one too. Me too, archaeology. Um, uh, they repeat these, these signs. They repeat on stones at, uh, uh, at Göbekli Tepe. And I'm inclined to play with the, the, the idea that it's, it's, it's a kind of prototype of the hieroglyphic script. But I only put that in words. I'm never going to put that in writing. <laughs> <coughs> so the kernel of the thesis I'm proposing to you is that this transformation from fluid, mobile, fission-fusion dynamics to life in large, permanent, co-resident communities was made possible by the emergence of fully symbolic culture and what one psychologist calls systems of external symbolic storage. Richly symbolic culture and the cognitive capacity to use and enjoy such an environment made large uh, communities uh, and the built environment the ideal arena. Uh, and uh, this is where I think we shall find the answer to Braidwood's nagging question of why then uh, why not earlier? In 1993, I'm pretty sure, I was asked to attend a Munro lecture in the university and indeed to give the vote of thanks at the end. The lecturer was a certain Professor Robin Dunbar, a psychologist then at Liverpool, now at Oxford. And that lecture, as it turned out, excited me more than anything I'd heard for many years and changed the direction of my research. Robin Dunbar is in the background. <laughs> Shortly afterwards, his book, Grooming, Gossip and the Origins of, and the Evolution of Language, was published, spelling out his ideas in much greater detail and giving me lots of references that would lead me into new fields of discovery. Robin Dunbar had th uh, three, in there's the, the current uh, cover of the uh, paperback. He had three important things to say about the evolution of the human brain. Compared to other taxa, primate brains had increased in size by much more than was necessary relative to our body size. The brains of hominids more than any other primate gen genus. And it was the cortex, the deeply folded outer part of our brains, that had expanded out of all proportion to the rest of our brains. The encephalization index is the degree to which the brain has increased in size relative to the overall size of the animal. It is well known that a larger body mass requires a larger brain, and the encephalization index for that should remain at one. Uh, among uh, primates, as Dunbar shows us in this graph, brains have increased in size mm -hmm. to a greater extent than is required uh, by body mass. And the early species of the genus Homo were pushing the index up beyond any contemporary primates. But Homo sapiens, up there with the red discs, has expanded quite disproportionately, quite disproportionately. Our brains are as much as six times larger than body size would require. In this diagram, parts of the modern human brain that have not changed in relative size are marked with an equal sign, and those parts that have expanded disproportionately are marked with a plus sign. The pluses are right through the neocortex, the grey folded area around the outside, and our ancestors had to evolve steep foreheads and a cranial dome to contain these vital areas of the brain. In terms of the neocortex, our brains are 100 times over-endowed compared to even other primates, and that involves a considerable cost. Some scientists have hypothesized that the hominid brain's singular expansion is nothing more than an arbitrary extravagance that doesn't happen to disadvantage hominids in the face of the forces of natural selection. But Robin Dunbar and the anthropologist Leslie Aiello, among others, have been at pains to show that this evolutionary trend was indeed adaptive. Running the human brain has real costs. Although the brain tissue amounts to only 2% of our total weight, I read, its activity absorbs 20% of the energy we generate. In order to support a larger brain, early hominids change their primate diet to one that is an omnivorous, especially including significant amounts of meat, and evolved a smaller, much more effective gut, which absorbs less energy but produces much more out of the, out of the job. <coughs> 
This diagram from Leslie Aiello shows that the proportions that would be expected are on the right uh, against those which are actually the, the, the case. If we were any other primate, what you would expect on the, uh, on the right. Uh, and for modern humans, uh, um, Homo sapiens on the left, what's actually observed. And as you can see, the gut has decreased very considerably uh, and the, particularly the neocortex area of the brain has increased very, very uh, considerably. Uh, all these interlinked evolutionary factors are not serendipity uh, uh, and what Stephen Jay Gould might have called a spandrel. These developments built what <coughs> Robin Dunbar calls our social brain. Dunbar plotted the neocortex ratio against the typical group size for primate species and he found a strong correlation between the neocortex ratio, that is the ratio between the grey folded bits and the total brain, uh, and the size of social group in which primates tend to live, as you can see uh, on this uh, uh, graph. <coughs> so the, uh, size of the, 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 the size of the neocortex, the ratio of the neocortex seems to rise in um, step with the exponential demands of living in larger social groups, the social brain. By extrapolating from other primates, Dunbar arrives at a figure of about 150 for the size of the social group that any of us humans can manage to keep up with, really keep up with. He concluded that this was a direct cognitive limitation on the number of individuals with which any primate, humans included, can, and I'm quoting him here, simultaneously maintain a relationship of sufficient depth that they can be relied on to provide unstinting mutual support when one of them is under attack. Because this is the core process that gives primate social groups their internal structure and coherence, this can be seen as, a cr as crucial for primate sociality. So physically, biologically, uh, our brains are capable of dealing with uh, um, groups the size of 150. Uh, Dunbar then sought uh, information on human group sizes from the ethnographic literature. Uh, and the bar across the centre of this diagram is the magic figure of 150. It's a logarithmic scale on the left. Uh, so the, the bar through the middle is 150 uh, and the uh, black um, uh, lozenges, black ovals rather, uh, mark uh, from the ethnographic literature uh, the size of uh, um, typical uh, communities like Aboriginal Australian clans. Not the group that you might find if you encountered them somewhere in the outback, but the clan, the community. The open ovals below the line are the typical hunter-gatherer bands in, hunter -gatherers, uh, in which hunter-gatherers spend most of their time. So these two symbols therefore represent the two halves, the two components of fission fusion societies. The open squares above the line uh, uh, are those of uh, larger segmentary societies uh, um, and uh, uh, but, uh, as far as I'm aware Dunbar doesn't go particularly into how those segments work whether they're lineages or clans or whatever. There was a problem for our hominid ancestors as group size grew and their neocortex expanded to cope with the exponential complexity of social relations. This graph charts the expansion of the neocortex of the uh, hominid brain through time with modern ho uh, humans at the top right. And now the graph has been changed, transformed into the time needed for grooming in groups of the size commensurate with brain power. In chimpanzees, the group uh, of chimpanzees, it absorbs 20% of their day. The average chimp spends 20% of the day in grooming. Extrapolating that to the size of human groups, Dunbar found that grooming would have uh, required an unsupportable 40% of the day. There wouldn't have been time for Rhine lectures. <laughs> Dunbar therefore suggested that hominids evolve language as a more efficient mode of engaging in social relations with one another because gossiping allows groups of four or six individuals to groom simultaneously. In search of evidence for his hypothesis he undertook research in the University Staff Club <laughs> at Liverpool and his postgraduate students made similar observations in the Student Union and they found that most of the time academics weren't discussing 
the difficult bits of chemistry or, or uh, the uh, vice chancellor's inadequacy at making decisions, they were gossiping in groups, and they were gossiping in groups of around five. And I wish I'd taken photographs at the reception, because if you can think back to the reception on Friday evening, it was exactly like that, and I missed this opportunity. I must have been thinking of other things. So there's the, the, uh, that graph, and we'll move on now. This uh, graph um, simply um, is a mirror image of the previous ones. It uh, uh, uses the same graph over and over again, same data over and over again, but sometimes you use it left to right, sometimes right to left. Dunbar notes that modern humans can just about manage what is called in, by psychologists uh, for levels of intentionality. That is to do with what is called theory of mind, something that we humans share with some of the species of primates. This graph uh, uh, puts uh, the numbers of the, the levels of intentional intentionality on the left hand side uh, from uh, uh, the baseline of Australopithecines up to uh, Neanderthals and modern humans. Levels of intentionality mean that uh, um, we need to be able to, uh, to uh, if I want to deceive you, which I hasten to add I'm not doing, I need to be able to put myself in your shoes, or rather put myself in your mind. I have to think, how can I put this so that that person to whom I'm putting it will believe what I want them to believe? Two levels of intentionality. I've got an intention, I need to know uh, how you're going to be uh, to interpret that. Yeah? Uh, and of course we, we do it much more complexly than that. Yeah? I suspect that she thinks that someone else is doing so and so. Yeah? Uh, so in order to live in the kind of groups we have, we have to be able to deal in these kind of levels of intentionality above the level of two levels of intentionality. And Dunbar concludes that um, <coughs> we can manage about four levels of intentionality. If we're really smart and our brain's really switched on and we haven't had too big a lunch, you can manage five. But four is even stretching things. For example, I bet you didn't think you were going to see that. <laughs> Shakespeare's play Othello, in that we, the audience, can work out that Iago has set out to deceive Othello and make him believe that Desdemona has got particular affections for Cassio. Yeah? And he even gets us to think what Cassio's thinking too, down the line, about Desdemona. Yeah? Yep. Our minds are working at at least four levels of intentionality, intention, intentionality there. But Shakespeare was going one level further because sitting, chewing the end of his pen, he's thinking how to write the line so as to make us, the audience, believe that, yeah, and so on. Yeah? So um, it's, we, we need to be able to operate at that kind of level of complexity all the time for social life to, uh, to, to function. Dunbar introduced me to the idea that hominid cognition had evolved from something similar to that of contemporary chimp chimpanzees to what we see around us in the world today, what we experience. He introduced me to the idea of the evolution of the faculty of language and its essential role in human social life. Above all, he gave me the idea the hominid evolution of the brain and of behaviour has been driven by the demands of living in larger and larger social groups. But he also raised questions for me and uh, posed unresolved problems in applying his ideas to the period of human prehistory in which I'm particularly interested. There is a significant gap between Dunbar's graph of gossip replacing grooming and the linguist's ideas about the age of our modern language faculty which is within the lifetime of the species Homo sapiens. In other words, within the last, they say, it varies, depends on who you read, 100,000, 50,000 years ago. We have a problem. Normally, as archaeologists, we make assumptions about the cultures of other societies at other times. We know what culture is, and we know how culture works, uh, because we've grown up and lived in a cultural environment, and we can handle culture. And if we're concerned with small-scale societies, well, we can always turn to the ethnographic literature put together by uh, hunter-gatherers, by uh, um, ethnographers on hunter-gatherers. If we accept that humans have evolved not only in terms of physical characteristics, but also in terms of their cognitive faculties and the power of the cultures that they can create, it follows that we cannot assume that our own experience of culture enables us to extrapolate to the cognitive abilities and the nature of the cultures 
of early prehistoric societies. They were different. The past is indeed a foreign country and they thought things qualitatively differently there. So we should turn our attention for a little while to language. In recent years there's been a renewed interest in the evolution of language and it is only natural that philosophers and linguists think that language is the key faculty of humanity. I think that the work of Terence Deacon is particularly helpful for us in this regard. His research combines human evolutionary biology, philosophy and neuroscience, uh, and his book, The Symbolic Species, explores how hominins have evolved a facility to manipulate symbolic representation, the most obvious version of which is our human capacity for language. Deacon firmly sets language within that broader context of systems of symbolic representation. And he also explains the difference between signs and symbols, using the work of the American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce, a logician and the, some, some say the father of semiology, the turn of the 19th to the 20th centuries. According to Peirce, there are three types of reference, of which the simplest is iconic. The iconic sign resembles its object. More complex, but still manageable by some other animal species, as well as humans, is indexical reference, illustrated in the diagram here. The reference between the sign, S, and the object, O, uh, is signified. It may be arbitrary and conventional, and that is how many of us think of language, encouraged by a little dangerous knowledge of the thinking of Ferdinand de Saussure. In fact, there are indexical links between signifier and signified in symbolic reference, but it is the logical relationship between the tokens that's important, uh, that makes the symbolic representation system so powerful. With language, for example, the most familiar form of symbolic reference, words get their meaning contextually within a network of syntactical and grammatical relations as well as layers of semantic complexity. Which is nothing compared to the complexity of these notes. <laughs> <coughs> The sense of a sentence is much more than the sum of the meanings of the individual words. Historical linguists believe that fully modern language emerged, as I said, 50,000 years ago, or perhaps as much as 100,000 years ago. At any rate, fully modern language has emerged within the lifespan of Homo sapiens, which goes back to 175, 200,000 uh, years ago. How that faculty for fully, mod for fully modern language evolved, and what a proto-language might be like, the language in which people gossiped, our early hominid ancestors first began to gossip when they found grooming was too much for them, is very much a matter for debate and, if not speculation. But what is important for us is the point that Terence Deacon makes uh, uh, in his book uh, that uh, uh, um, language is one form of symbolic representation, one form only. Another psychologist, Merlin Donald, has a different way of tackling these questions. He's not so much concerned with language in its evolution as with the evolution of human systems of representation and communication, how we think about things and how we represent them to each other. His hypothesis is that, I quote, the modern human mind evolved from the primate mind through a series of major adaptations, each of which led to the emergence of a new representational system. And again, humans did not simply evolve a larger brain, an expanded memory, a lexicon, or a special speech apparatus. And this is the important bit. We evolved new systems for representing reality. During this process, our representational apparatus somehow perceived the utility of symbols. So somewhere along the line, we became symbolic, capable of handling uh, symbolic things. Donald sees the evolutionary path of systems representation and communication are going through three transitions, as I said. And it's the third transition which concerns us. But in order to appreciate its importance, I should just uh, mention the, the earlier ones. Donald starts from the baseline that is shared by our closest primate cousins. Their memories and communication potential is, in his word, episodic. They are bound by the a moment, but their ability to share through communication is constrained by the lack of a facility to communicate. The first transition occurring uh, early in hominid evolution is labelled by Donald 
as mimetic culture and defined as, quotes, non-verbal action modelling. In other words, mime and gesture, including vocal gesturing, in, encouraged, share, encouraging shared attention and a degree of communication that we would probably find remarkable, unless you can remember Les Dawson, the comedian, <laughs> who, when he was doing that drag act, yeah, in which a woman's talking to, talking to her friend about Mrs. So-and-so and she's no better than she ought to be, yeah, he did it all after the start of the sentence, entirely with facial expression and, and gestures. Yeah? Wonderful stuff. Non-verbal action modelling. <coughs> Steve Mython discusses a, 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 at length similar multimodal but non-verbal communication in his book, The Singing Neanderthals. With the advent of full modern language, there was the potential for storytelling and oral culture, which is why Donald calls his second transition mythic culture. I include two small quotations because most of us would not connect language and, quotes, a much more powerful means of explicit recall from memory. Philosophers, however, would recognize what Donald is talking about when he says that, quotes, the essence of language lies in its power to address and organize knowledge and make it accessible for further reflection. We who have enjoyed the faculty of language from childhood can easily appreciate just how powerful a tool it is for so many different purposes. Thinking back to the skills that we possess to grasp what Dunbar called force level intentionality, can you imagine how the story of Othello, the play Othello, could be represented without the subtleties and nuances of language, whether in the hands of Shakespeare or some simpler narrative account? Michael Tomasello puts this very succinctly. I saw this only last week, a, t uh, um, uh, the a tagline at the end of an, an article he'd written. Chimpanzees know what others know, but they don't know what others believe. Yeah? The keys to the development of the human brain are not just its size, but rather its plasticity. The newborn human infant's brain doubles in size over the first year or two of its life and goes on growing, and as it grows, it's getting wired up. And it gets wired up in response to the child's experience within the environment in which it, it uh, um, finds itself. For today's infants, as for those born into the Neolithic communities in Southwest Asia, the environment is intensively cultural. Merlin Donald calls the process deep enculturation. <clears throat> the modern human brain goes on being plastic, we go on learning. Even old dogs do learn some new cultural tricks. Something that humans acquired during their evolution was a capacity called shared attention. Shared attention is very important uh, to our ways of learning. It enables us to, to uh, cultural learning. And it starts with small uh, infants. Shared attention between an infant and a parent or another relative gets the child started in the process that the psychologist Michael Tom Tomasello calls cultural learning. The cultural brain hypothesis is based on the uniqueness of this capacity for cultural learning. We are born with an evolved capacity for cultural learning and the process literally forms and continues to shape our living minds. I can illustrate the point. Recently, a little girl called Tess was just short of her second birthday. She understands quite a lot of what's said to her, but she doesn't have many words for replying, only a very few, maybe half a dozen or ten. Her grandfather told her that tomorrow was her cousin Tom's birthday. Tess knows about birthdays. Granddad said there would be a party, there would be a cake, we would sing happy birthday to you. And Tess thought for half a second and then responded, Yes, there would be candles, and at the party, Tom would blow out the candles. Granny asked Tess if she'd like to help make the chocolate cake for Tom's birthday. There's always chocolate cakes in our family. Shared attention. There it is, shared attention and deep concentration for fully half an hour. Tess is learning about holding spoons, mixing things, controlling implements with her hand, but she also knows the context. She connects chocolate cakes with birthdays, which means parties, singing and blowing out candles. Even at the age of two, Tess can assemble information, skills and ideas into formidable hierarchies that are well beyond any chimp 
Within such contexts of deep enculturation, Tess is learning language at an incredible rate. That was last November. Now she can hold telephone conversations with us. And in fact, she's already bilingual because she, her childcare is France. She lives in France and her childcare is in French. <coughs> Michael Tomasello and some of his colleagues at the Max, Cl Max Planck Institute in Leipzig undertook a battery of tests on children aged two and a half chimps and orangutans. The tests were designed to show whether humans had a greater general intelligence or particular skills in terms of cultural and social intelligence. The results showed that all three groups, children, infants aged two and a half, chim uh, chimps and orangutans, uh, were, uh, a were on a pretty similar level in terms of their understanding of the physical world. But in terms of understanding the social domain, a two and a half year old child is way ahead of what an adult chimp or orangutan will ever achieve. Back to Merlin Donald with the third transition, the advent of what he calls theoretical culture or theoretic culture. Modern humans could add to their capacity for mimetic and narrative or mythic culture the ability to put things on record. Donald starts this final transition from pre-literate to symbolically literate societies in the Upper Paleolithic with two-dimensional cave paintings and three-dimensional modelling of figures. Its completion, in Donald's analysis, came with the first use of alphabetic writing systems in the Levant around 3,000 years ago. <clears throat> Just look at what Donald says about the way that this third transition transforms the capability of the mind. This transition was marked by a long and culturally cumulative history of visuo-symbolic invention, he says. It isn't clear to me why Donald sees alphabetic writing systems as significantly different from their predecessors uh, uh, in the Near East in the form of Mesopotamian cuneiform or Egyptian hieroglyphics, but, uh, or the Chinese script, uh, but that's not really the, uh, that's not really the point. Uh, I am more concerned to assert that Donald has missed a trick uh, in the evolution of what he calls external symbolic storage. Putting things into external memory, he says, involves completely new memory media. Uh, and that's his uh, uh, introduction to what he calls external symbolic storage. This is one of his uh, diagrams. He goes on to say about external symbolic storage that it enables humans to create qualitatively new types of representations. Once we can put things that we are thinking out there in a form where they can be picked up by others, shared, commented on, added to, argued against, built upon. According to Donald, we are capable of experiencing ideas that are categorically different from those of earlier uh, generations of, of uh, hominids. Although I want to make a case for the architecture, sculpture, and other symbolic furniture as, as a system of external symbolic stories that predates the beginnings of writing, it's easier to illustrate the principle in terms of printed works using a di this diagram from Donald's book. It comes easily to me to think of an academic library as a, an external symbolic storage uh, system or network. A, a network of interrelating text, excavation reports, studies of different kinds of artifacts, monographs, lines of journals on the shelf full of uh, many articles each. These cross-refer cross to each other and if we're seriously interested in following up on a subject, we find ourselves reading A's comments on what B wrote on the subject five years ago. And when we consult what B wrote, we may find that there are further references uh, which are intriguing and which we want to follow up. That's us coming in as the, the users of, of the uh, library, consulting the authors in this system of external symbolic storage. Some will be living authors, some will be dead authors. External symbolic story systems have a historical di uh, dimension. Having read and digested what we found, any of us may then seek to contribute our own to penneth, submitting our own essay for publication, with all the appropriate references, of course, thereby contributing to the enriching of the overall resource. And for me, acquaintance with the resources of that library not only extends my knowledge, but transforms how I think. Colin Renfrew was as impressed as I was by Merlin Donald's ideas about external symbolic storage. He convened a workshop at the MacDonald Institute in Cambridge to which Merlin Donald was invited and several archaeologists discussed the application of ideas 
of in external symbolic stories to material culture, the kind of things that archaeologists deal with. The papers from that conference were published in 1998, and Collins' own contribution was a powerful case of the kind that I briefly made, that systems of external symbolic stories do not have to wait until writing comes into use, but rather that communities, he was thinking of Neolithic communities in Western Europe, <coughs> could and did construct material frameworks of external symbolic storage in the form of monumental landscapes. In a concluding contribution to the conference, Merlin Donald adjusted his views and substantially agreed with Colin Renfrew. Merlin Donald has subsequently written another fascinating uh, book, A Mind So Rare, in which he explores how the minds of modern humans have learned to work. He talks of deep enculturation and discusses it in great detail, the embeddedness of each of us in a rich and symbolic cultural world that is essential for our de development from infancy and for our participation in the world. Other psychologists and social philosophers put things in different terms but are talking, I think, about the same essential quality. Andy Clark has very recently published a new book, Supersizing the Mind, whose subtitle is Embodiment, Action and Cognitive Extension. The phrases for which he's probably best known are the extended mind and embodied cognition. He argues with vigorous conviction that it is entirely false to think of the human mind as encapsulated within the brain locked inside a skull and distinct and separate from the rest of the world. Our minds are part of our bodies and our bodies are part of the, the world. He has a wonderful quotation uh, uh, from somebody else who uh, saw the work of Richard Feynman, the very distinguished American physicist, uh, some notes which uh, uh, Feynman had made and he said, oh, there's the notes you made when you were uh, um, working out the idea of so-and-so. He said, no, said Feynman, that is the idea. Yeah? That is the idea. Yeah? <coughs> uh, the list could go on. Uh, Antonio Damasio has written extensively on culture as scaffolding which enables the mind to climb where it otherwise could not reach. Uh, and uh, uh, there are um, others too. Michael Tomasello, The Cultural Origins of Human Cognition and so forth. The case that I'm making is uh, simple. External symbolic storage networks can be non-verbal and pre-literate. Think how much information we can read as we look around the architecture of Edinburgh's Old Town, for example or how much we can get when we walk around, walk into any medieval European cathedral. In Southwest Asia, the first domesticated societies, I'm using that phrase that uh, Peter Wilson uh, used, and the first domesticated societies emerged using architecture in various ways. Remember how we saw that some structured their settlements as they structured their way of living in the settlement, how their house architecture expressed the monumentality and history and longevity of the household recall their dramatic communal buildings. The formation and maintenance of large permanently co-resident communities requires continual symbolic interaction. All the advice we get from psychologists, anthropologists and sociologists tells us so. From the Epipaleolithic beginnings then, people went on in the Neolithic to be the first societies to realise the symbolising potential of architecture in the built environment. As we've seen, Neolithic communities uh, created theatres, stage sets. Living in their artificial built environments, they built and inhabited the stage sets that the drama of, of, was the drama of life in these communities. Neolithic communities realised the capacity for these architectural external symbolic story systems to embody notions of time. They could memorialise the past, their past, and the very fact of the durability of the architecture meant that ideas, knowledge, beliefs and practices were stored and transmitted from past through present to future. The house became, or the hut became a house, became an institution. As part of the 250th anniversary program of the British Museum, an exhibition was staged entitled The Museum of the Mind. The exhibition and its accompanying slim book were the work of the senior keeper in ethnography, John Mack. The central idea was museums as places of dramatic encounter with treasured material culture, theatres of memory, a phrase that he took up uh, from certain Renaissance Italian pioneers. Mack reflected on the importance of memory to identity, noting that psychologists link memory loss 
with identity crisis. The museum memorializes something important about our identities. Daniel Liebskind, the architect of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, one of the most powerful buildings I've ever been into, has said that it is, quote, the destiny of architecture to communicate and to evoke the conditions of memory. What the Renaissance pioneers, John Mack and the British Museum and Daniel Liebskind were thinking of was museums as public institutions like temples and monuments. And just think of the architecture of our own museums and galleries. You've only got to walk down to the foot of the mound and look at the National Gallery of Scotland to see a temple of culture and of memory. We have good reason then for saying why Covin's revolution of symbols came when it did, why culture was ready then and not earlier. <clears throat> if the first fruit was the art of the Upper Paleolithic, rather like the first isolated single words of the human infant learning to speak, then uh, the full achievement was the emergence of phonetic writing systems, then what we are looking at are the first systems of external symbolic storage. In answer to his own question, Robert Braidwood apologetically concluded that in some way culture was ready. In the light of the new theories of uh, psychologists and all the new light uh, that we have on the working of the human brain and the formation of the human mind and consciousness, we can see that he was certainly looking in the right direction, but too early. Why was it necessary? What was the pressure? What were the adaptive advantages of adopting this new way of life? These are questions that we can take further in the final lecture. What is certain is that large scale, life in large scale communities in which the individual was not related to everyone else and didn't know everyone else, even at the level of casual acquaintance, required means of establishing a sense of community. Communities needed trust, means of establishing norms of behavior, means of registering shared membership of the community, shared ideas of community identity, means of supporting collaboration and cooperation at the expense of the individual. All these abstract notions required symbolic interaction and a shared symbolic cultural language for those interactions. In the last lecture, I shall try to plait the various strands together and spin you a tale that tells of a new perspective on the Neolithic Revolution. Thank you.